Hi, this is Dr. Rajesh Khanna from Khanna Vision Institute. I'll be your host for the Khanna 2020 show. We are doing this show to educate you more about eyes and vision correction surgery. We're going to look at the structure of the eye, how it functions normally, and what causes the anomalies which prevent us from seeing to a full potential. We are also going to remove a lot of miseducation out there on the internet and discuss the barriers to getting better vision. So let's look at the structure of the eye. The outermost clear part is called the cornea. Then there is some liquid between this and the natural lens. Behind the natural lens, there is a jelly-like substance called vitreous. And finally, the last part is the retina, which is an extension of the brain. Now let us understand how the eye really works. The eye is more like a camera, except it has got two lenses. Whether you believe it or not, the front part, the clear part called the cornea, is actually the most powerful lens in the eye. But it's a fixed focus lens. In the middle of the eye is the variable focus natural lens. It acts like a zoom lens and adjusts to the distance we are watching the eye. So let's look at the accommodative lens or crystal lens. It's a much bigger lens because it has to curve in the eye. It's clear and it allows the light to come to focus on the retina. Because of its curvature and its flexibility, it moves a little in the eye and makes some adjustment as the object moves from far to near. Now this works great if you want to see clear at all distances. But because there's limited amount of movement and how much curvature we can achieve in a, such a small place like the eye, that we will get, let's say, distance and middle and some of near. So for a tall person, it works out very good. They are used to reading at arm's length, which falls within the range at which crystal lens will work. But let's say somebody is not as tall, then they will not be able to see up close but we'll be able to see distance and middle. We can use the principles of blend vision. That means one eye can see far, middle, and some of near, and the second eye with the crystal lens can see near, middle, and some of far. This is not monovision where one eye is seeing far and the other eye is seeing near. This is more like a blend vision where all the three distances get blended between the two eyes and brain is able to fuse the images into one. But if a person is not very tall and wants to see with each eye at all distances then the multifocal lenses are a good choice. The way they are constructed or designed they allow images from all distances to be focused on the retina and when both eyes are done the images are superimposed on each other giving us binocular depth perception and making it as natural as possible. Hi this is Dr. Rajesh Khanna from Khanna Vision Institute. Welcome to the Khanna 2020 show. Our goal is to make America see again. So let us see what's preventing us Americans from seeing great again. One of the commonest factors we have seen is fear and lack of education. And that's our goal at Kana 2020 to make these fears go away. Fears can only go away when there is knowledge and education. And we want to be able to impart this knowledge and education in the simplest terms. The reason that we are so fearful about eye surgery compared to our toes being operated upon is an evolution mechanism. When anything comes near our eyes, our eyes instinctively blink. That's been a protective mechanism for millions of years. The lids were designed to protect the cornea and the internal structures from debris in the atmosphere. And that has been retained in the subconscious of our minds. And anything that comes near our eyes, whether it be light or objects, we develop a fear. So we have to understand why modern day surgery is safe and can help you over, overcome your fears. Because one of the greatest fears people have is, when I'm having the surgery done, will my eyes instinctively close and cause problems? There is a very simple way to overcome this. The solution for this is known as an eye retainer, which we put in the eye and keeps the lids apart. So whether you're doing LASIK surgery, pie in eye surgery, 
or keratoconus surgery, we are able to keep your eyes come open comfortably without any impediments. The second commonest question I'm asked is what if I move? And that's why you need to choose a good surgeon who has good skills and whose hands don't shake. Because when you move, we can adjust. So if you are doing pie and eye surgery and if you move, the surgeon should be skillful enough to adjust to your movements and be fast enough to make compensations for your movement. 20 years ago, we stopped putting injections in people's eyes because needles can cause problems. So we don't immobilize your eyes anymore. That means you have freedom to move your eyes during cataract surgery and pie and eye surgery. But the surgeon still has to be very adept and focused on your eye. Another question we are asked is, oh my God, I will not be able to stare at the light all the time. And the answer to this question is very simple. You don't have to, and in fact, you should not be looking at the light during the surgery. When we are looking at lasik eye surgery, you'll be focusing on a beam only for 15 to 20 seconds. And that goes away in a blink of an eye. Also with lasik eye surgery, we have very advanced mechanisms which are also available on space shuttle. What that means is, if your eye moves, the laser can move with your eye at a very rapid speed. So even if your eye is having subconscious certain movements, the laser adjusts for those movements and this is known as eye tracking. When we are doing pie surgery, we don't want you to look at the light because the light can damage your macula and the central part of the macula called fovea. In fact, we ask you to look away from light. Another question people ask, which develops a lot of fear in them, is what if things come straight at my eye, I'm going to get very nervous. And the answer is very simple. Nothing in our surgeries for the eye comes straight on, head on. So we don't operate like this, we go from the side. So if you try it yourself, put your finger up and bring from the side, you will not see it. So whether we are doing pie surgery or keratoconus surgery, everything comes from the side. And even in lazy eye surgery, we lift the flap from the side, not bringing anything head on. Let us look at another question which has troubled a lot of people. They say, I'm afraid of needles. Welcome to the 21st century where we don't use needles no more. All our surgeries are getting more automated. When we look at LASIK eye surgery, we don't use freehand blades anymore. Gone are those days. Everything is automated. So whether we are using an automated microkeratome or laser to make the flap, there's no sharp needles involved. And even in pie and eye surgery, we've progressed such so much that everything is done with topical drops and special drops which are put inside the eye. So we don't give injections like we used to do in our grandparents' time. I remember when I first started three decades ago, we used to give injection near the ear to immobilize the facial muscles. Then we used to give an injections right close to the eye to immobilize the eye. And in the end of the surgery, we had to patch the eye. So now things are a lot different, no needles. That means no needles, no sharps, no pain, no injections, and quick recovery with no patch. Another important question or fear which has kept a lot of people away from refractive surgery like lazy eye surgery or pie and eye surgery is the fear of pain. And welcome to painless rapid recovering surgery. Why is there pain? Let's look at that. Our body is supplied with nerves and the cornea and the eye is supplied with a large number of ner nerves as a protective mechanism. Over the years we've developed techniques to numb the eye and numb the nerves so that the brain does not get transmitted to the brain. What we have also found out is very important that you don't have to numb the whole body. In fact, we want to avoid numbing or putting you to sleep because if you do have pain, you suffer in silence. What that means is, if you are knocked out or put halfway in twilight zone where you can't speak, you may still be able to feel pain, but you'll not be able to express it. And we want to avoid that situation. And that's why we don't tie you down and tie your head anymore, because every time we are put in a cocoon, we get restless. That's not a natural state. 
So we like to operate in a natural state where you're talking to us, giving us constant feedback about any uh, pressure, feeling of cold or wetness, pain or water going into your ear, etc. So you're awake but relaxed. So it's more like being in an alpha rhythm where you're thinking pleasant things, listening to good music in the background, and looking at the outcome, which how it will improve your life. And finally, retina is like the film of the old-fashioned cameras or a microchip of the newer cameras. The whole goal of our eye is to bring to focus images from various distances onto the retina, which as I said is an extension of the brain, so that the neural signals can be relayed to the centers in brain and vision can be interpreted. Now, different problems in vision can occur from different areas of the eye. And we are going to look at each individual structure and its function and how that can affect our vision. So let's look at the fixed focus lens or the cornea, which is also the clearmost outer part of the eye. This has a shape which allows in a natural eye for the image to be focused on the retina. But if it is very much curved or very flat, then the power of the eye changes and the image will not come to focus on the retina. So if it's very flat, the image will come to focus behind the retina because then it's acting as a very low powered lens. In the opposite scenario, if it is very much curved, then it acts like a very strong lens and the image will come in front of the retina. When the image comes in the front of the retina, this is known as nearsightedness. That means you can see everything close but not far. Medically, this is termed as myopia. And when the cornea is flat and the image comes behind, that's known as farsightedness or hyperopia. That means you can't see near and can't see middle and maybe you can see far. And if the cornea is curved asymmetrically, that means one meridian is more curved than the other, that's termed as astigmatism. In that condition, the image does not come to focus on retina at one point, but at multiple points. And what that does to the eye is the brain constantly tries to change the variable focus to see better, but is unsuccessful. The muscles come into play, and you know, muscles feed off the blood vessels which supply nutrition. So more blood vessels dilate to accommodate new uh, blood cells coming to the eye. The eye turns red. It also gives rise to irritation, fatigue, and even headaches. The next part we have to look at is the natural lens or the variable focusing mechanism of the eye. You'll all be familiar that what happens at around 45 years of age, we lose the power to see near. This is because the focusing mechanism of the natural lens starts to deteriorate. In the normal eye, the lens is held inside a bag stretched by zonules. It is similar to being sit lying down in a hammock and the strings of the hammock tied to a tree, let's say, being able to adjust with the wind, so to allow us to have a freedom of movement. But if the strings of the hammock were tied too tightly and we did not have any ability to move, then it would be difficult. This convoluted example is to bring to the fact that in a young person's eye, the zonules can move the lens and change its shape. So as objects become closer, the lens can become more spherical, allowing us to see much better. So the lens is very crucial for us to adjust our distance perception from distance to near. That means as an object, let's say a car is coming towards us. We see it far and our eyes relax, that means the natural lens or the very focal mechanism is uh, at the lowest power. It brings the image to the retina. As the car comes towards our eye, we need to change the focusing mechanism so the image can still be retained on retina. That means the natural lens has to become more spherical, curved or more powerful. And this is a continuous mechanism brought about in a natural state of the eye. But as we grow older, this mechanism starts to deteriorate. By 40 to 45 years of age, some problems creep into this mechanism and the lens becomes more and more rigid. So that by around 60 years of age, this mechanism fails totally in most of the people, almost close to 99% and they are not able to see things at near 
or even middle. So this is an uh, important part which occurs universally in all the people. Let's look at the inaccuracies in total corrective power affecting our vision. We'll go step by step because this is one of the most crucial understanding points we have to go over today. When a person suffers from nearsightedness, that means they can see near, not far. Now depending on the nearsightedness, their focus point might be very close to the eye or a little bit far. Now why does nearsightedness arise? It can arise from the cornea or the length of the eye. The cornea, which is a powerful lens, if it's very curved, will act very powerful magnifying lens and bring the image in front of the retina. Also, if the eye is very long, then the image will not reach the retina and so we will not be able to see things clearly. Exactly opposite of this, let's consider the two conditions when the cornea is too flat so that its power is diminished and as the object is seen, it's not brought to focus on the retina but behind the retina as a virtual image. Or if the eye is very short, then the, also the image will focus behind the retina. The third important thing we have to learn is astigmatism where the shape of the eye is not symmetrical. Again, this could arise from the cornea or the internal structures. So if the two meridians of the cornea, let's say the vertical meridian and the horizontal meridian have different refractive powers, then instead of one image being formed, there'll be two images and they'll appear as blurred images. This can lead to a lot of fatigue. So it might get complicated, so follow closely on this next part. These three imperfections can be even combined together. So what that means is you could have nearsightedness and astigmatism. So that means, that implies that instead of one image being formed in front of the retina, we'll have multiple images being formed in front of the retina. Or if it's a mixed astigmatism, that means one image can fall in front of the retina and one behind the retina. So you don't have to worry about all those convoluted situations, just understand that there's more than th that meets the eye. So now we're looking at these imperfections of the eyes. It's important to understand that these imperfections can also be combined with each other. That means when we have astigmatism, we can also have nearsightedness. What that implies is the image does come to focus in front of the retina, but not as one, but as multiple images. Same thing can happen when we have farsightedness combined with astigmatism. The images will fall behind the retina and cause confusion. It gets even more interesting if one image is in front of the retina and one is behind the retina. This is known as mixed astigmatism. It is very important that your eye surgeon understand all these different concepts. Each of these imperfections has a tailor-made solution for it. Gone are the days of the last century when one size fits all was used, that means one surgery was done, whatever imperfection you had. In the 21st century, we have been trained to treat each imperfection with a specific procedure. So a compound astigmatism, that is when one image is in front and one is behind, will have a different kind of treatment than when both the images are in front. Now let's talk about another imperfection in the eye which creeps in with age and this affects the variable focusing mechanism of the natural lens. This is known as cataract. Now cataract is very simple to understand. If, if we are sitting in a car and looking through the windshield, it's clear. But now let's imagine we're going through a storm and dust settles on the windshield. It will make all our vision blurry. So what do we do? We put the windshield wipers on, throw in a little water and clear it up. Now that's a very similar thing to do what we do with cataract surgery. Except instead of just cleaning it, which would have been our goal, but we haven't achieved that, what we are able to do is replace the windshield with a new clear glass. Now it's important to understand we don't remove the frame. And when we get into cataract surgery and pie in eye, that becomes a very important concept. The windshield is removed and a new windshield is put in the frame, which needs to fit in exactly in the frame. 
Same thing happens when we are doing modern day refractive cataract surgery or PI. The lens is opened up and the, its contents are removed by suctioning it with vacuum and fluids. So we don't remove the whole lens, we just remove the contents of the lens, polish the bag and put an artificial biocompatible lens in the natural physiological position. So we are trying to recreate how nature made a rise. We are trying to replace the natural lens with an artificial lens which is made of usually acrylic and it does not cause any allergies in the eye. And we place it exactly in the same uh, place and this restores our vision. So cataract is any time there is an opacity or coloring of the natural lens which prevents the light from reaching the retina. It's as simple as that. So if you are sitting back in your car and you're looking through the windshield and somebody throws a stone at the windshield and it cracks, now you will not be able to see outside. It becomes blurry. And as the crack spreads, the vision decreases. Same way in the natural lens, the fibers are clear to allow the transmission of light to the retina. But when there are imperfections creeping with age, and why do they creep in? When we have hair, the lens fibers are similar to hair. As our hair grows long, we go to the supercuts or a barber or a hairstylist and get them cut and reshaped. Unfortunately, there is no place for the lens fibers to be going. So they keep getting condensed in the center. New fibers are laid on from outside and they keep pushing the older fibers in the center. That means the new fibers which are outside are the youngest and the central ones are the oldest. So the oldest fibers decay and undergo change in color and become yellow. This leads to something called a nuclear cataract, which prevents the light from going from the real world to our retina. There can be other reasons for cataract formation, chief being trauma. If something hits the eye, the lens capsule allows water to seep in and that changes the consistency of the fibers and they become colored and stop functioning. Radiation, diabetes, thyroid disease, all can affect the pumping mechanism of the natural lens and allow water to creep in and cause change in the structure and function of the natural lens. Hi, this is Rajesh Khanna MD from Khanna Vision Institute. Welcome to the Khanna 2020 show. Our goal is to make America see again. In today's episode, we are going to talk about cataract surgery and what's the difference between cataract surgery, refractive cataract surgery, and finally, pi. Cataracts have been present for thousands of years. That means people have identified lens changing color and losing vision from thousands of years. In fact, the first cataract surgery was done, believe it or not, 2000 years ago. But how it was done then to how it's done in the 21st century and how it's done in 2015 and 2016 is vastly different. As we have progressed with time, we are trying to emulate nature and be as physiological as possible. So we'll step back and take a brief history of cataract surgery over thousands of years. Let's go back in time to 2000 years BC when people first discovered that cataract could be cured. So a wise surgeon named Susruta took a needle and pushed the mature white cataract behind into the eye. And suddenly, lo and behold, person could see again. But this was unnatural and non-physiological because the cataract fell back and then there was no focusing mechanism left in the center of the eye. So over time, let's go now to Europe in the 17th century when cataract surgery was rediscovered and they came up with two techniques to remove cataract. Either you could remove it in total, as a whole, take out the lens, or you can open it up and remove its contents and leave the eye. In both the conditions, the eye was left very far-sighted because one of the focusing mechanism of the eye was lost. This was corrected by strong lenses called aphakic lenses, which were very thick and which had a lot of problems. 
The FAK lenses, which were very strong lenses and had very strong prisms on the periphery, led to a lot of complications in vision, or a lot of glare, aberrations, and something called jack-in-the-box phenomena. That means when the, these glasses were worn by a person who had had cataract surgery, they could see things in the periphery and they would disappear as they went into the mid zone because of the prismatic effect of the lenses. And the same person would reappear when they came in front. So this would startle the people who wore those FAK glasses. And, but they continued in popularity for a couple of hundred years because there was no choice. Then come World War II, Harold Ridley with the Royal Air Force discovered something unique, that an Air Force pilot had some glass go into his eye and that was totally inert, did not cause any side effect or reaction. So this genius thought, why not put some glass in the center of the eye after the cataract surgery, so would, which could act as a lens, because magnifying like glasses are made of lenses. So he tried that and it worked. And that's when the modern day cataract surgery really starts. So he put in a fixed glass lens which gives vision back without needing glasses. And as we progress, the size of the incision or the opening to take out the lens has gradually decreased and the lens has become more and more physiological. So in, from what I mean by that is from the 70s to the beginning of the century, a fixed focal length lens was put in. A fixed focal length or monofocal lens was put in the eye. That means it allowed us to see at only one distance. So whether it could be distance, middle, or near, but not at all distances. So a compromise was made and one eye was usually made for distance, another eye was made for middle or near, something called monovision. But as again we've been talking, this was not physiological. This leads to loss of depth perception and things like driving and all can be difficult if not dangerous. Now in modern day times, we've overcome these barriers by coming up with these advanced lenses called presbyopic implants or PIE for short. PIE, P-I-E stands for presbyopic implants in eye. So that's the culmination of all the evolution of cataract surgery over thousands of years where we now have the ability to be able to see good at all distances, near, middle, far. That means you could pick up your smartphone and see, read a book or a map, and then look far and drive without the aid of glasses. But we have to understand it's not like a static surgery. It's not like you put in something in the eye and it starts working. Pi means we have to remove all imperfections at that particular age. That means we have to correct the nearsightedness, the farsightedness, and even astigmatism to get the best results out of them. There are different kinds of pies being made by different companies, and let's discuss each one of them. Hi, this is Dr. Rajesh Khanna from Khanna Vision Institute. Welcome to Khanna 2020 show, where our goal is to let America see great again. Today, we are going to discuss about pie. Mind you, not the pies you're used to eating, but PI, which stands for presbyopic implant in eye. Presbyopia means the inability to see at near, and presbyopic implant is a device or a lens which overcomes this imperfection of the eye. So there are two major kinds of PI, accommodative and multifocals. What accommodative means is that the lens is able to change its shape inside the eye. So this tries to mimic a natural lens which becomes flatter when we are looking in distance and more curved and more powerful as the object of interest moves closer to our eye. A prime example of this is crystal lens which is manufactured by previously by Bosch and Lom and now by taken over by Valiant. The multifocals are manufactured by two different companies, Abbott manufacturers the Technis multifocal and Alcon manufactures the Restore multifocal. The reason I'm mentioning the companies is so you know that this technology is being backed by major companies who are doing a lot of research and back their products by years of uh, studies both in Europe and FDA clearance in the USA. So the multifocals work a little differently than accommodative lens because they are 
not moving in the eye. They sit in one position, but they are a marvel of modern day physics and engineering. They use some nanotechnology principles to create minor elevations on the surface of the lens, which are microns in uh, height. This allows the incoming light to be split. Therefore, light coming from far and near can be focused at the same time. This might sound a little confusing, so let me give you a little example. Suppose we are looking far away at a nice tree with a lot of flowers, and then I start looking at my finger. So I can look at both objects, my finger and far, but when I focus more on the finger, the tree appears a little blurred. And then when I look up, the finger gets blurred, but I have constant range of motion. With the multifocal lenses, we see both distance and near, and the brain chooses which one it wants to focus on. This adaptation of the brain is known as neuroadaptation. So what we have found out with multifocal lenses, as time passes, believe it or not, vision continues to improve. That's the real marvel of Pi, that with time, instead of something deteriorating in our eyes or in our body, we have something which improves. There's nothing like cars or computers which improve with time. It's only Pi which leads to better vision as years roll by. Today we are going to talk about glaucoma, what causes glaucoma and what are the latest strategies in overcoming this disease of glaucoma. Glaucoma is any time when the pressure in the eye is too high for the nerve to be able to function. As the pressure goes high, there is a lot of a force applied on the nerve fibers exiting from the eye. In the eye, the nerves are the only structure which leave through an opening and this opening is limited in diameter. When the pressure increases, the fibers are pushed against the edges of the opening and they can undergo atrophy. So that in a sense is glaucoma. And how do we detect it? We can measure the pressure, but more importantly is to see the function of the eye. This is done with a machine called the visual perimetry or visual field machine, where you are looking at the real world in a simulated atmosphere and we are able to detect if there are islands missing from your visual field. Glaucoma has been prevalent for many years and the main stay of treatment so far had been drops and then lasers were introduced and finally something called glaucoma surgery or trabeculectomy that's a tongue twister and glaucoma surgery called trabeculectomy was introduced it's a complicated surgery which has a lot of side effects. Today, the latest thing we can talk about is eye stents. We know the pressure is getting high in the eye and the outflow is blocked. That's why the pressure gets high. So we can put a small stent, just like we do in the heart, to create an exiting mechanism for the fluid to leak out safely. Hi, so we talked about pi and we discussed there are 9 or 12 types of pi. One of the common reasons I see a lot of patients is because they were told they are not good candidates for LASIK eye surgery. So let us look what are the alternatives to LASIK eye surgery to still get you to 2020 vision. Glaucoma, what is it and how is it caused? Let's look at this balloon for example. We are pumping in air from one side and let's say there is an exit mechanism for the air to leak from the other side. Glaucoma can be either caused by overproduction or decreased drainage which will lead to expansion of the balloon and also bursting it finally. Now what we have found out over years of research that glaucoma is more likely to be caused by decrease in outflow rather than in you know, overproduction. So in a sense, for practical reasons, glaucoma is a decrease of outflow of the fluid from the eye, leading to increased pressure, which damages the nerve fiber layers, affecting our vision. So the best way and most physiological way would be if we can increase the outflow from where it normally occurs, but has got blocked. And so we took this concept from the heart surgeons and using a stent to overcome this obstruction. We have overcome this by putting a metallic tube inside the eye. This tube is inert and the eye does not react to it. So it allows the fluid of the eye to be egressed out or 
flow out of the eye through almost a natural pathway. This allows us to control the pressure inside the eye 24-7. And unlike drops where compliance can be a big issue, we have to remember every day to put the drops once, twice or even three times a day. The eye stain works quietly seven days a week throughout the year. And this is more physiological, so it can prevent the spikes in early morning, which can normally happen. And all this is projected to lead to a better control of glaucoma. So let us look at the alternatives to LASIK eye surgery. You have been determined not to be a good candidate for LASIK eye surgery. And you say, oh man, I would really wish to see better. So how can we make America see great again without relying only on LASIK eye surgery? So we have a couple of choices based on your age. Let's say you are under 45 years of age and you have nearsightedness. So we can switch from LASIK eye surgery to super LASIK eye surgery. Super LASIK is, stands for superficial LASIK eye surgery. In this uh, operation, we don't make a flap but treat the surface of the eye to change its shape. This is a little slower in healing and that's why it's not as popular as LASIK eye surgery but as we mentioned it is safer. Now if you're not even a candidate for super LASIK eye surgery then we can implant contact lenses inside the eye. These lenses don't have to be taken out from inside the eye. The current American FDA approved lenses are known as Vision ICL. These are made of columnar, which is like a biological substance, so it's very safe for the eye. It sits above the natural lens and behind the colored part of the eye. There is another variation of implantable contact lens known as varicize, which sits above the colored part of the lens. They can treat nearsightedness up to 16 diopters way beyond the power of LASIK to correct those imperfections. And if you are above 45 years of age and you want to see up close, we have camera inlay. A small disc is placed in the front part of the eye, the cornea. And this has a small aperture or opening much like our camera. And this allows an increased depth of field. So if you want to see near or far, you can see both. So this has been a great achievement and this has got approved by FDA in 2050. If you want to be able to see at all distances with both eyes, then we have an option of pi. Just to come back, camera inlay is done in only in one eye, usually the non-dominant eye, and that allows us to see at all distances. Or you have nearsightedness or farsightedness combined with presbyopia, pi is your best option. So LASIK will not work in these conditions because LASIK works on cornea, which as we discussed is a static lens and our natural lens is the dynamic lens. So you replace apple with apples and oranges with oranges and not apple with oranges. In the past we had to resort to that. That is when we had problems with presbyopia, we did LASIK and did monovision to overcome those problems. But today we do exactly where the problem is. So if you have nearsightedness, farsightedness, or astigmatism, which are static problems, we treat them with LASIK eye surgery on the static lens, the cornea. But if it's a dynamic issue, that means your natural lens is not moving or it's got imperfect or become hazy, we replace it with pi, which can mimic its function of seeing at all distances. Now, a lot of people get very confused. Doctor, there's so many pies out there. Uh, which one do I choose and what's best for me? That's why I wrote the book, The Miracle of Pi in Eye, to help you select the best lens suited to your lifestyle needs. It's not old-fashioned way of practicing medicine where the doctor told you, now you need surgery, now you don't need, or you need this lens. Because you know your lifestyle better. No doctor in a 30-minute or a two-hour interview with you can know your lifestyle exactly like you do. We know our lenses and you know your life. So we have to make a happy match of both these knowledges to come out with the best outcome. Uh, and in my book, it's full of real life example where different technologies can work for different people. 
Let us look at some examples. If you're a pilot who starts his day at dawn flying in between high tension wires, you need to be seen clearly without any side effects or glare or halos. In those conditions, crystal lens would be a very good option. But if you're a housewife who wants to be free of all glasses, then a restore lens would be working great for you. If you've had some previous surgery and you still want to see at all distances in each eye, a Technis multifocal would work great for you. And the more you tell me about yourself, the more tailored-made solution we can do for you. Whether it you be a cop, a CEO of a big company, or a firefighter, we've helped everybody see better. And besides your profession, your uh, hobbies like sports, whether you play golf, matters to what exactly we do. Hi, today we are going to discuss astigmatism and how we can treat this malady. Astigmatism is an imperfection in the eye where the curvatures of the eye are not symmetrical. That means the vertical curvature can be different from the horizontal curvature. This results in multiple images being formed on or off the retina. If you are young, the best way to correct astigmatism is laser eye surgery. This gives better outcomes than with contact lenses or glasses.